Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is Sonship Establishment. And I think I have this right. I think your notes are supposed to read 33 and 34. And if, they, if they're in error, when I first did these up, I even made an error the other way. And my notes say 35 and 36, but that's not right. So are, are yours right? Yeah. Okay, very good. All right, there's something I want to straighten out right here at the outset. Now, to do that, let me introduce something I know that you're familiar with. The two categories of suffering. You already know these, but I need to make a point about them. The suffering of this present time. When the Bible talks about that, you know... You're talking about the sufferings that we endure because we live in a fallen world. That is, we get old, things don't work as well as they used to when you get old. You were involved in an accident, you slipped and fell off a ladder, somebody ran into you while you were sitting at the red light. Uh, those are all part of the sufferings of this present time. God's not ordaining them, that's not a punishment. And when Paul talks about it, as we're going to see in Romans 8, 18, as a matter of fact, let's just look at the, ver at the verse, Romans 8, 18, he says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so that first category of sufferings, I know you know about it, those can range from something very mild. I have a, well, I was going to say a migraine, but I've never had a mild migraine in my life, but uh, from a headache to uh, contracting some dread disease. I mean, it can be all kinds of things. Those all fall under the suffering of this present time. Then you have the suffering of Christ. And that is the suffering that we do because the policy of evil is directly attacking you. It is a satanic attack, but it is not just because it has a very specific purpose in mind. In the beginning, it is to get you to stop your sonship education. That's what it's designed to do. And if you will stop, those will immediately go away. The suffering of this present time, you're going to have your whole life. You came into this world with that, and you're, and you're going to live your whole life under those things. Now, the thing that I want to clarify, because I hear, I, I just hear people say, and I'm not just talking about here, but I'm talking about every, everywhere where folks are involved in sonship, I just want to make sure that I clarify this issue. When we're talking about the sufferings of this present time, you should do everything you can do to avoid that. Let's use the car accident. Have you ever been watching? Uh, when, I, when, when traffic stops unexpectedly, I've been on the interstate in Dallas, and there's been a wreck, and you, you top a hill on the interstate, and everybody's doing 70 miles an hour, and all of a sudden, there's nothing but red brake lights in front of you. And you know what I do? Is I, I, I start slowing down, but I start looking in my rearview mirror because I know the moron behind me is not watching. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to whip over onto the shoulder and let him ram the per. So nice for me to do that, but I don't want to get hit. And I've done that before. Do you know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to avoid that. And sometimes if you're careful, you can do that. Falling off a ladder, you didn't mean to do it, but sometimes if you just, you knew it was on rickety, uneven ground when you started, or you didn't have it folded out all the way, just take the precaution. And it'll save you some of that. Yeah, you're not trying to do it. Well, here's the point of clarification. Don't get to thinking, because of the way we've been talking about responding to the sufferings, that you're supposed to go through all the sufferings of this present time and not do anything to fix it. If you have a migraine, take something for it. If you're sick, go to the doctor. If you, if you slam your finger in the car door, 
Don't just sit there like you're suffering for Jesus. Open the door and take it out. Nobody expects you to spend the rest of your life with your hand slammed in the door. Now, I know that that sounds a little bit ridiculous, but I just want to, because I've heard this statement, I need to clarify for you that when you're talking about the first category, you're not violating anything by trying to get out of that. Those things are everywhere. By the way, you can do your best to avoid those or to fix them, and you're still going to suffer under that, believe me. There's still coming a time when you're going to suffer under that. So, just fix what you can fix. That's not, he's not talking about you not trying you know, to become a, a suffering martyr. I mean, you know, that's... Okay. Now, in the second category, you realize you're going to get to a place in your life in the curriculum, it's going to start in Romans 13, where the policy of evil is going to kick in on you, and it is going to begin to do things that is made to make you walk away from your sonship. But listen to me carefully. It's not these types of things that it's going to do. In other words, the policy of evil is not giving you, you know, pneumonia. The policy of evil is not you know, causing you to fall off the ladder. The policy of evil is not trying to, it's not the guy, you're sitting at the red light like I was one time and somebody wasn't watching, they just ran right into the back of us. That, that's, not, that's not what that's about. That's not how the policy of evil works. Those are part of the sufferings. Of pre They're never going to go away. You'll avoid some, some are going to be minor, others might be major, but there they are. The policy of evil is going to be suffering that you will undergo because you are involved in what we're involved in right here. You're going to know what it is. In other words, you won't go out, that, here's Eric and he goes out in the parking lot after a, a sonship lesson in Romans 13, and he looks and one of his tires is flat. He's not going to be able to look at that and say, it's the policy of evil attacking me. No, it's just all the debris that's on the road. It's the suffering of this present time. But if someone were to come to Eric and make his life miserable over the issue of sonship, that would be the policy of evil, the suffering of Christ. Do you, do you get that? You get those differences. So when Paul says he's suffering these sufferings, this category of suffering, he is saying, when, when he says, I want the fellowship of Christ's sufferings, when he's saying, I rejoice in infirmities, he's, not, he's talking about this kind. You understand? He's talking about this kind. Why? Yeah, because he's making an impact on Satan's realm, and Satan's unhappy about that. So the more things Satan does to you, it's because you're having the greater impact. He's not... He's teaching you how to endure these, but he's not going around saying... Oh, I'm so glad I got run over today. That's not what he's doing. Uh, is everybody clear with that? Now, maybe nobody here had a question with that. But I actually received that question. And so if there's con co some confusion about that, I want to clear that up so that we all understand m most of those, th all of those things that Paul is talking about, about the fellowship of his sufferings and rejoicing in iniquity and... I, I rejoice, rejoicing in iniquity. What? This is a cult. <laughs> okay. Rejoicing in infirmities. <laughs> like I don't know the difference between an infirmity and an iniquity. Oh, brother. That's under this category. And Paul says, yes, you know what? Bring those things on. But he never says, bring on the suffering of this present time. You're going to get those whether you want them or not. Avoid all you can. Fix those that you can. And then, and then 
patiently endure the ones you can't. Everybody with me? Any question about this before I get back on track? All right. So Romans chapter 8, where we are here, is the first time we get introduced to the first category of doctrine, the suffering of this present time. And it's the first time that you're presented with a particular doctrine that is supposed to help you patiently endure those sufferings. And it is the doctrine of your glory. And I want to talk to you about that doctrine. This is going to be great because we're going to actually discuss some things we haven't spent too much time on. But this doctrine is supposed to work in you so that when the sufferings of this present time happen in your life and you can't, there's something you can't fix, or maybe it's only temporary, but you're in it right now, then you go through that to the honor and glory of your heavenly Father. He's looking for something. He's looking for a right response to that. And this doctrine is going to work in you to produce that. And the part that's going to produce that is this. Sorry. The glory which shall be revealed in us. That's the doctrinal part that you're supposed to have in your thinking. And it's not just when you're suffering, but that ought to be in your thinking all the time. Now, I want to talk to you about the glory. Because when the doctrine is given to you, God does not mean for you to think like this. Well, God talks about a glory that's going to be revealed in us, but I really don't know too much about it, and I really don't know how it works. That's not how He wants you to think about it. And that's why Paul is going to give you details about the glory so that you will understand what that glory is about and, what, and how that glory enables you to patiently endure the things that you suffer. Those are the things that he's going to be teaching us. Now, and with regard to that, let's, let's do this next one. We also learned previous to this verse in Romans 8 that there are two inheritances that you're going to get. Now, I'm not backing you up for no reason, but this is connected. The first one is the heir of God inheritance. Does everybody get that one? Yes. Everybody gets the heir of God inheritance just because you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. But then you have the joint heir inheritance, and everybody doesn't get that one. That one is in direct proportion to your education as a son, your ability to labor with your father, and it's in proportion to your right response to these two things. If you have a right response to suffering. I'll just give you an example. Wednesday this week, I was sick. That's not a, I'm not complaining. I'm not griping. We've learned you don't gripe about that, right? Tuesday at the study, I saw Rick Davis had his wrist all wrapped up, and I went, what would you do to your wrist? He said, I wrenched it. But I'm not griping. <laughs> all right, so here's the idea. Wednesday, I am just sick. I never throw up. Never. Since probably eight years old. Tuesday was the exception. I don't know what was. I ate something. I don't know what it was. But boy, I was in misery. And so you know what I'm thinking this whole time? I got to go through this to the honor and glory of my Heavenly Father. So, so instead, of, instead of going in there and falling down on the living room floor and, and saying to Billy, you know, Oh, why is God doing this to me? You know, I've got to go through this the right way, right? If I preach it, I need to do it. So this is a good way for the Lord to say, well, here's, here's where you get to put this into practice because generally, I feel good pretty much every day. Generally. I live close to Bob, but still, I feel pretty good. Here's my point. As I'm going through, that's just the suffering of this present time. Everybody gets sick like that. Does it feel good when that happens? But I'm thinking, I've got to go through this to the honor and glory of my Savior, so there's some things that I'm supposed to be thinking about. I'm going to talk to you about those things. This is a real practical application of the doctrine because the glory is the first, it's not the only thing, 
but it's the first thing that you're confronted with when you're told about the sufferings of this present time, that those sufferings are not worthy to be compared with a glory that is going to be revealed in us. So I want to talk to you now about that glory so that we do understand some things about it. And like I said, that, that glory is talked about in some detail as we go on through Paul's epistles. We'll, we'll get over to Corinthians, and, and a lot of things are said about it over there. Let me talk about the first part of the glory. Oh, I, I was going somewhere with this, and I don't want to get off track. The heir of God inheritance. Remember, I was talking about those two inheritances, and I want, I want to make a point about that. You are first introduced to this and the glory that goes along with it. Just because you're saved, we're told about that back in Romans 5 when we introduced justification. Take a look. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope. Hope of what? Of the glory of God. That's the glory that's associated with the heir of God inheritance. There is a glory with that inheritance. And you're going to get it just because you're saved. But now, what about this joint heir glory? And by the way, there are, there are some things that you'll get as, a, as an heir of God that um, you get them there, but they get enhanced in your joint heir inheritance. For instance, one of the things is and we'll talk about this glory is, the glory, let's just put it under a heading. The glory, first of all, is going to be revealed in the body that you're going to get for eternity. That's why we call it a glorified body. Now, one of the, one of the things about glory is light. Do you remember when the shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks, and it said, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. It was a light. Your glorified body, and I'm going to we'll take you to a verse, but your glorified body is going to emanate light. So, one of the things, <laughs> I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but as Paul begins to talk about these bodies, he's going to talk about, well, let me just take you to the verse here. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 15, 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. That, there's different kinds of bodies, right? Then he says, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. In other words, one's heavenly and one's... Earthly. Yeah, earthly, terra firma, terrestrial. Okay? Look at verse 41. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for one star differeth from another star in glory. Now he's been, he starts out talking about bodies. Then he makes this, this analogy. He's going to return to talking about bodies. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But here's what you have to understand. First of all, the body you're going to get in eternity, your body is different from any other body that anybody's going to have. Well, there's a lot of bodies in that. Your body's different from the body that any body is going to have. But it's also going to be different from each other. Our bodies, although they're all glorified bodies, are going to differ from each other. As one star differeth from another star in glory. Let me give you an example. Here you are involved in your godly edification and when you get your glorified body, the light, and there, we have to go to other verses to see this, but the light and the color that comes from that body is going gonna, is gonna to show radiantly. And then you meet someone that got saved. All they are is an heir of God. Now, I mean, that's not like that's, I mean, when I'm saying all they are, I'm not acting like salvation is not a big deal. It is. But it's just the start, right? It's just the door. So here's, the, here's a guy that got saved, but he never did a single thing with his godly edification. Never. 
Didn't care about it. Think about what kind of light is going to be emanating from that body. That's when you truly will be able to sing. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. <laughs> Hide it under a bushel. <laughs> a glorified body that's really been involved in godly edification is going to look way different. Think of those bodies as rank insignias of the uniform. When you're in the military and you see stripes, you know what those mean. When you see a, a bird on the shoulder, you know what that means. When you see stars on the shoulder, you know what that means. Those are all insignias that let you know instantly the person you're looking at carries this rank. And you're going to see that by your own glorified body. But now here's the next thing, and I'm not going to take a long time to talk about this, but your glorified body is going to be changed in five particular ways. This is really interesting. Let me just show it to you, and you can do some work on this your own. Don't read over this lightly, because this is something that is remarkable. But as he's talking about these bodies, and talking about just as the glory of one thing differs from the glory of another. And by the way, these glories, the glory of the sun, the glory of the moon, the glory of the stars, does have to do with light, by the way. But now take a look at this. I'm just continuing in the same passage. Verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Now what does it mean in corruption. What does that mean? Oh, okay. <laughs> right. That, that, it's, it, that body will be immortal, will it not? That body is never going is it? will it ever grow old? No. Will it ever be subject to aches and pains? No. So that incorruptible, that there's, there's, there's more to that, but there's one. Here's the second one. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. This is not talking about the light of glory. Now it's talking about glory in another sense of honor and prestige. There is a prestige that goes along with that body. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. There's a power that this body is going to have. And it is sown a natural body it's raised a spiritual body. I've just shown you four of the five changes that are sitting in this chapter. And this, this body that you're going to... And when you look at it, you, it, you have this tendency to just read over it and go, no, it's raised a spiritual body. But that has meaning. All of these phrases, folks, are just pregnant with meaning. That, and to understand all that's sitting in these phrases is to open up our understanding of really what this body is going to have with regard to glory. Now all we're talking about is there are five particular changes that are going to happen to this body that's going to radiate light, that's going to be, that's going to be raised in, in corruption and in glory and in power and, 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 and as a spiritual body but there's more than that. Think about the glory of where you're going. Now you're talking about the glory of the heavenly places. Now, you ever seen those pictures that NASA sends out, uh, prints up from the Hubble telescope? And you see, those are really pretty incredible. And if you've ever looked through a really large telescope at even just the planets, it's really pretty incredible. But now, I don't want you to think about that because what we're looking at right now in the heavenly places is a creature that doesn't look like it has any vestiges of life in it. I'm talking about you taking up your residence, your vocation in the heavenly places when there's a new heavens and a new earth. If this is what the almost dead one looks like, what will the fully functioning creature look like? 
Is that going to be incredible? That's a glory that's associated with you again in your joint heir inheritance. That's a glory you're going to experience firsthand. I mean, you can look up there now and you can see, like, when you look up in the winter and you see that constellation Orion and you have Betelgeuse up here, Rigel down here, and you have these three little stars. There's actually some stars that are out like this, and you have three little stars that make the belt. And if you look, there's actually some little stars that hang down like a sword that hangs off the belt. But these are first magnitude stars. They're very bright, very prominent constellation. The middle star down here is actually a nebula. It's actually a, 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 a a, a whole, it's millions of stars that are clustered together so far away that they appear from this earth to be a single star. And if you were to look at that nebula, it's called the Great Bay Nebula of Orion. If you look through a, a telescope that's big enough and see that nebula, there are pictures, you can go online and find pictures of it. It's just absolutely incredible. What would it be like to say, yeah, I've stood there. Yeah, I've seen that been there. I used to think that our glorified bodies would be just the same as Christ. Yes. Yes. That we would look like Christ. Or at least that's what I thought. It just doesn't sound that way. Mm. You're going to get me off on a tangent. Uh, okay. No, no, no. But that's good. That's okay. Uh, let me repeat it for the DVD because you're talking about your understanding before was that our bodies would be like Christ and in their immortal glorified nature they will be, but that we will look like Christ. And um, in some measures that is true, but it won't be true for everybody, in every measure, Bob, and here's why. Because there's going to be different levels of joint heir inheritance and those bodies themselves are going to be insignias of who you are. So the, the people in the sonship that are really going to be different. It's the people in the sonship that are really going to be different. Yes. Yes. And we may have more time later to actually talk about that issue, but there are some subtle differences. As you look at those bodies, I know we talked about that years ago and we did that kind of business, but you know, when you look at those bodies, you know, here's here's Gloria out in the heavenly places and she's got this real bright appearance. But it won't be, and, and how bright will Christ's appearance be? Do you remember it says when he comes back at the advent, he will destroy that wicked with the brightness of his coming. Do you remember that? His light will obviously exceed everybody's. So there's not an identical, I would have to tweak the things that I used to say about that to say, it's not going to be an identical point for point thing but there's going to be a lot of similarities between those glorified bodies and between His glorified body. But when you look at Him, you will see a marked difference between Him and anybody else. But when you look at you, but, but, but when, you, when you look at Norm out in eternity, you're going to see a marked difference between her and a lot of and, and other people as well. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. Now, as we as we look at these differences in these bodies and we realize that there are heavenly places the place where you're going to be and here's the next thing the position in which you are placed to labor with your heavenly father out there is a position of glory can you imagine when when here's ruby and she comes into to some place and they're going to they're going to look at her and they're going to go she's the one running that part up there She's the one in charge. Now Ruby's laughing now because she... But you know what? Here's the thing you need to really see. He's not telling you this just to state the fact of it. He wants you to see the reality of it. This has to be as real to you as the car you're going to get in and the home you're going to drive to. That understanding has to be that real. That's what's going on with this. So the sufferings of this present time are going to come into your life and what they're going to do is they're going to vie for your attention, your mental attention. And this is where your mental attention is supposed to go. 
And you're going to have to do that on purpose. Because it's not going to be an automatic knee-jerk reaction. You're going to have to learn to do that. You're going to have to, and I'm going to talk to you about some details of that. Because as time goes by and we get older, all of those sufferings begin to increase. The body gets weaker. But that doctrine is meant to effectually work in you so that those sufferings really aren't worthy and you're convinced that whatever I'm going through is not worthy to be compared with this. That this really is holding out something to me that far exceeds anything that I'm going through here. And because you're... Let's just do some verses here because I'm going I'm to take you to these. But you're going to have to say, just like I said Wednesday... I have to think about the glory that is going to be revealed in me. Do you know what I had to understand? There is coming a day when my body is no longer going to feel these kinds of effects. I'll be able to eat bad Chinese food and it won't bother me anymore. Because I'm suspecting that's what it was. So what am I, what am I supposed to do in the meantime? You already know the answer to this. What am I supposed to do in the meantime? That's right. And by that, I, by knowing what's out there, I'm supposed to patiently wait because he's going to take all of this and you, just going to, you know what he's going to say? This is your hope. That's what's sitting out there for you. Take a look at this verse, Romans 8, 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And that is true. Sometimes you'll be hurting so bad, you'll be so sick, something will happen that you'll be thinking to yourself, Oh! But even though you're groaning within yourself, this doctrine is supposed to work in you to enable you to put your mind on, on the hope. The fact that one day this body is never going to experience this anymore. And I'm going to be in a position that I'll never experience these things anymore. All of this is going to be gone. All I have to do is patiently wait for that hope to become a reality. And how long is that going to take? However long it takes. But if you're patiently waiting, you're not doing this. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Patiently waiting is however long it takes. Verse 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves. And we will. Waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. You're waiting for that time when this body is going to get redeemed and those things are no longer going to be an issue for you. No more pain, no more groaning, no more sufferings of this present time. And until that time comes, Here's what you know. You're going to go through it. God's not going to deliver you from it. You're going to get old. Some of, you, some of us are going to do better than others. But it's just the way it works. I, I, I've just never seen anybody delivered from getting old. And when you get old enough, it always ends in the same result. You die. There have been no exceptions to that. That is the end of the bondage of corruption as it goes to work on us in this world. So with that in mind, here's what we know. We know that, and by the way, let me give you this verse 24. For we are saved by hope. Let's talk about the word saved. He's not talking about being saved from the debt and penalty of your sin. That got covered back in Romans 1 through 5 with your justification. What's he talking about being saved from? Oh, 
okay? Saved from it in, the, in that it won't happen to you. Yes, saved from the effects of that bondage of corruption. Because that thing is... How many times have we heard people, just with the normal human thinking, talking about, you know, when they get over toward the end of their life and what all of that is, or bemoaning their situation, or why me, or getting bitter at God, and all kinds of... The, that we're saved from the effects of that by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what doth he yet hope for? You don't see this hope, but that hope has to become a reality to you. This, this thing isn't going to be this way forever. It's only going to be this way for now. And I have to add one more thing to it. And that glory... If I'm going through this, my proper response to this suffering, because this is the one we're talking about now, my proper response enhances the glory of all of these areas. Do you see what do you see? So when you think about patiently enduring it, it's not just one day I won't hurt anymore. What allows you to patiently endure it is to know one day it will be over, but while I'm going through this, I have an ability to build on that glory. It's going to be a greater glory. And the only way you get that is by a right response to it. What is that? The patient endurance. How am I going to do that? That's what, that's what grace provides for you. And, 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 we are, and, and, and we'll be talking about all of that. Actually, a lot of those details that are over there are, are actually going to flesh out a little further. But that glory, that's why I said to you, that glory should be in your mind every single day, not just when you're going through this, because that way this becomes the reality. Think, I, this is a terrible illustration, but you ever planned a vacation in advance and you told your kids, okay, you know what, in, in July we're going on vacation. And then, you know, here comes uh, uh, April, and May, and the kids are asking about it, and then June, and then you really start, get, and, then, and then the July comes and you start packing the suitcases and things get, you know what, you know what all that does? It, it, and you start talking about the things you're going to be doing. Have you ever said this? Down here is the way it works. Sometimes the expectation of what you're doing is more exciting than the actual doing of it. You ever, you ever, isn't that true? But here, it's going to be of such a nature, folks. But you build the reality of it this way. You build the reality by saying, this is where I'm going. This is the way it's going to be. If you're already laying in the hospital, you say, one day, this body will never be hurt in an accident again. If you're me, you say, one day I'm never going to be sick again. And if I can respond rightly to this thing right now, the glory that's going to be reflected in my body, the glory that I'm going to have in those heavenly places, the position that I'm going to occupy, I'm going to enhance that glory. That's how that gets done. Now that is not the way the world looks at suffering. The world looks at suffering as, and, and like I told you, suffering this present time, if you could fix it, then you fix it. But there's some things you can't fix. And when you can't fix it, the world wants to go, why me? Or the world wants to go, why is God judging me? And you know, depending on what church you're in, then you get those accusations. Oh, you're sick, must have sin in your life. Something's going on. We prayed for you to get well, you didn't get well. You, no, there's got to be something wrong with you. 
and that's the and that's the finger they will point at you. Now, uh huh? What about suicide? Well, certainly there's not. I mean, let's say it like this: if if someone were to end their own life, if they're saved, they're still going to heaven. They're still going to get a joint heir in here. I mean, an heir of God inheritance. They're still going to be in the heavenly places, but there's not going to be a joint heir reward for that. Because they would have responded to the sufferings of this life in a way completely contrary to the way their father wanted them to do that. So they're still going. I know that there's circulated for many, many years this idea that if someone commits suicide, that's the unpardonable sin and you can't go to heaven. And the reason they say that is, if you kill yourself, you, 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 it's too late to ask for forgiveness, so that's the unpardonable sin. That's not the unpardonable sin. That is not the unpardonable sin. If you end your own life, you have been victimized by the policy of evil to such an extent that you would do that. By the way, the doctrine we're talking about now is the doctrine that fixes that. It's the doctrine that allows you to endure the most devastating things that can happen in your life that would make you give up. This is the do And Paul's the example of that. Do you remember when he talked about that we were pressed out of measure? He said, and we despaired even of life. You remember that? He said, I got to a place where I just didn't even want to go on. This is the doctrine that fixes that. And Paul said, it did it for me. This is the doctrine that will do it for you. Because the worse the suffering, guess what? The proper response, the greater the glory. There are people that are going through things that I've certainly never gone through. They have an opportunity for glory I've never had. But they had to go through that to get that. So you could, you know, most folks would look at me and say, oh, well, you're lucky. But when we get up there, it won't be about luck. It's going to be about who responded rightly to the doctrine. Well, when, when, when we get over 2 Corinthians, we're going to get to see a lot of this fleshed out. I really need to move on here. So let's take a look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace... Now, he's, remember, now I'm going to switch gears on you. Now, we talked about the sufferings of this present time. Now, I want to draw a line and I want to talk about the sufferings of Christ. Because not only does Paul introduce that in Romans 8, but he is also going to devote an entire book to this, and that is the book of 2 Corinthians. The entire book is about handling the suffering of Christ. That glory is still going to be in your mind as a reality. The proper response is still going to enhance that glory. But as we go through this, man, I am way behind. As we go through this, what I need you to see is that Paul is going through some things for the simple reason that the Corinthians need to learn these things. So God is having him go through them, be the model or be the example, so they can learn how to go through them as well. So he says, for all things are for your sakes. It's because of you guys that I'm going through this. So you'll see, you don't have a situation that God can't handle. I'm going to go through it, and you'll see me go through it, just based on the doctrine. Not because I'm Superman, or I don't feel pain. But look at this next point. That the abundant grace, and that's the only thing I want to call attention to here, it's abundant grace. And thank God that it is. Now let's go through the verse. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to something. And what is it supposed to redound to? Well, we'll finish the verse. Redound to the glory of God. And here's what, here's what you learn now. You not only have a hope, that all this glory, and more than this, but all this glory is waiting for you. 
you not only know that a proper response to either one of these sufferings produces a greater glory, but now you find out that that proper response turns around and produces a glory to God. It redounds to the glory of God. That word redound is not a word that we use very much in our vocabulary. So I just want to talk about it. The word redound, when, I look, when you look that up in the dictionary, it says it means to overflow. That's the, the first primary meaning. Well, that's not a bad word. It overflows to the glory of God. But, but there's something else about that word redound. The word redound means there is a benefit that someone receives that is a byproduct of something else taking place. In other words, here's what God is doing. God is giving us a doctrine that produces a hope that allows us to rightly respond to either kind of suffering. And if we do, here's what is done. There's the primary thing. But as a result of that, as kind of a happy byproduct, God gets glorified through that. Now, I need, now there's a point here. I, I think I probably abandoned my notes here. Um, as we go through this, I did, I, I got off these notes and talking about this. Let me just look for a second, make sure I haven't skipped something before I go on here. Did we talk about that? Did we, did we talk about this? And not, yeah, we, I know we read this verse. For some reason, I just, and we run through it. I think I mentioned this already that, you know, this is, this is where I was going to tell you. There's coming a time when that body is not going to do that anymore. You know, it's not going to hurt anymore. But we're waiting for that part of the adoption, which is the redemption of our body. It's the final part. It's what ends up everything. It's what completes the adoption. And, and, and that's what's going to happen to that. But, you know, and boy. I really, I don't, you know, I organized this once and now I'm looking at this and what I really want to do is organize this in a different way. So I think this is what I'm going to, I think, just looking at this time, I got two minutes and they're going to give me the red light. Uh, there is an issue that you need to be aware of. There are statements that the adversary has made boast that he has made which explains why God is doing what he is doing in this dispensation of grace if you don't know about these things you'll always be wondering why is God allowing this and why is God allowing that we, we think of someone that was a really good person that was really serving the Lord and their life is cut short early on and you always wonder. When I, when I was a young preacher boy, there was a group out of Florida that kind of put themselves together as a revival team and they would travel around from church. And, and the guy that was the head of it was Del Faisenfeld Jr. That was the guy that was heading it up. And they would go into these churches and they would, he would preach and, and they had all these teams of folks that would counsel with folks and try to get the church back on, you know, line to serving Jesus and all that kind of business. And this guy was having, you know, what we always looked at as young preacher boys as marvelous success. And suddenly he died. I don't remember if it was some, something he contracted or was in an accident. I don't remember. But I know his life was cut short. And I can remember sitting with my preacher boy buddy saying, why did God allow that guy to die? Because there's a bunch of guys. We, you know, we wouldn't miss. 
I mean, you're not trying to be ugly about it, but you know, we were just thinking. Here was a guy that was really trying to do something. And his life was... Those, but we didn't understand what was at the core of all of that. So we had those questions. Okay, that means I have five minutes. That's what that means. They so give me the red light. I have five minutes. That's what that means. This is a longer session than normal, but just a little longer. This... Uh, These things that Satan has talked about, these boasts that he has made, I'm trying to, I'm, let me just look and see if I can just get you over there in the PowerPoint. Man. I got verses I'll have to skip if I take you over there. Man, I am just, I am dying up here. I really need to get this done in these sessions. There's a verse I need to take you to. and I, All right, let's just do it like this. There are some things that Satan... Let me just kind of wall this off. There are some things that Satan has said. I know we talked about that. And it has to do with that he has a superior wisdom to God's wisdom. In other words, he has a better way of doing things than God does. That's one of the things that Satan maintains. He also maintains that as far as power goes, his power is more than sufficient for him to be the ruler of heaven and earth, and, and, and he has the ability to do that. What your heavenly Father is doing in this dispensation of grace, now there's some other issues here too, but what he is showing is that your heavenly Father possesses a wisdom that the adversary doesn't have. Your heavenly Father possesses a power that Satan not only doesn't have, he didn't even know existed. Now you think back at the powers that they knew existed. We've talked about it. They saw him speak the world into creation. There's a creation power. They saw him part the Red Sea. There's part of his omnipotent power. They saw him bring water out of a rock and bring manna out of heaven. They saw all of that. But what they never saw was the power they never saw, even back in God's program with Israel, the power of God's Word to produce something that Satan cannot produce. It's impossible for him to do this. That power is called the excellent... Remember we talked about the excellency of the power. It's the most excellent power God possesses. It not only excels every other power... It's a power that until God began to put it on display through Paul in the dispensation of grace, Satan didn't even know it existed. Now think about this issue. I'm putting a bunch of stuff together. You can read the notes and get it. But look, when Satan boasts and says, I will be like the Most High, he thinks he has all the power necessary to do that. He thinks he has all the wisdom necessary to do that. Satan's wisdom would never come up with the idea of people going through sufferings, patiently enduring them, that 
they would receive a glory and at the same time it would redound to the glory of God. That's how it gives glory to God because God is putting on display a power Satan never saw. This power of something bad is happening, make it go away. Satan knows that. Can he do that? Can Satan control things to make things better or worse to his whim? Of course he can. That's why the prayer is not for deliverance. The prayer is for endurance because that is what puts a power and a wisdom on display that Satan doesn't possess. Only God possesses that power. When you go back to anything else, you're putting something on display that Satan himself can do. And you know what that means? He is as good at ruling this thing as God is. He can do it. Do you see what I'm saying? But when you're talking about a power that Satan looks at and goes, how do you do that? He has no idea. You're talking about a wisdom that men would certainly never come up with. And when you rightly respond to what Paul writes about responding to those sufferings by patiently enduring them, not only does it bring glory that you know is being built for you, but it brings glory to your Heavenly Father. And here's the third thing it does. It throws it into the face of the adversary. That your wisdom isn't good enough. Your power is insufficient. In other words, it takes more to rule heaven and earth, buddy, than you ever thought it did. You thought you could show up and run everything and there are, there are aspects of God's character and His essence that you don't even know about. Guess what? Those didn't get revealed until they were kept secret with the mystery. Do you see? Alright, here's my fear. I, I know what I'm saying. I just don't know if I'm saying it where you're going to go away at the break here in a minute going, what in the world was that about? I need you to be able to see, I need to be able to say it without taking too much for granted that there really is an issue here where God, what God's doing with us is not what He did in the past because Satan can replicate that. He is putting an excellency of knowledge, an excellency of of power on display to all creation, but especially to Satan. How demoralizing is it for God to put the power of His Word working in you when you're under suffering that allows you to patiently endure with your eyes on your hope, knowing what that is doing, knowing that this is building that glory, knowing it's building glory to God, and knowing it's showing just how inadequate the adversary is. That's what you're showing. He can't cut it. We want to go back and live the other way? Satan can match every bit of that. We're not putting anything on display that's that special. Moses threw his rod down and became a serpent. You remember what the, the sorcerers did? Same thing. Turned the water in the blood. They did the same thing. Satan has power. You don't think, you know he has power. He's going to give life to the image of the beast so that it speaks. The whole thing about false idols were, as the Old Testament prophet talked about, they claimed they spoke, but the lips they carved in them never moved. You had to have a medium, a priest or a priestess that said, oh, the idol talked to me. Like they had a special gift. 
because everybody looking at the idol just saw this thing sitting up there. They just, they just saw this carved image and it had lips and it had eyes and it had a nose and it may have even had hands out here. But you know what? The hands never... That's why the prophet said, they have eyes, but they see not. They have noses, but they smell not. They have ears, but they hear not. They have lips, but they move not. They have hands, but they handle not. They have feet, but they walk not. You're look, he's, and you Gentiles got fooled into thinking it was the living God? They bought, we, bought, we bought into the counterfeit. Talking about just Gentiles and Gentiles. Bought into the counterfeit. When you talk about Satan unleashing the fullness of his power, he's going to create an image, and it's not just going to talk, and its lips are going to move. It's going to come to life. How many people are going to buy into that? God says, you know what? you got power. But I have power you never even knew existed. I have wisdom you never knew existed. And if you're going to be the rightful ruler of heaven and earth, you're going to need all of this. And this is the part Satan doesn't own. He can't produce it. He can't replicate it. So you know what he does? He keeps us from it. Because it is the thing that we put on display that proves him to be inadequate for the job he's trying to steal. That makes sense? You're just telling me that so we go to the break. <laughs> That's the point I'm trying to get.